So thank you for coming to Belarus. Thank you. And actually, uh, a lot of the things we were speaking about are very relevant. Uh, not all of them, probably. <laughs> and actually, I want to sort of look at this from the perspective of Belarus to make it more relevant to the context in which everybody of us operates daily. So uh, to do this, I need to give you a bit of about context about what our country is about. And actually, mm -hmm. we are not going to the battle, we are going to the minefield. <laughs> because any discussion about the culture, because it's not widely held in the society, and because Belarus is only like 28 years an independent country, 29, right. so, uh, and actually 28, so uh, it's kind of um, yeah. a little bit complicated. So, but anyway, so uh, first of all, I just made this um, interesting list. Um, I've, uh, you know, like in the uh, 1950s, mm -hmm. IBM was uh, very successful in making their uh, computers. And uh, what they were doing actually is they, were, they went around the world and tried to sell them everywhere. And they thought they're great. They have amazing culture, they're great. I mean, it's very much American leadership style. Yeah. And uh, they failed miserably. And uh, the reason why is because they haven't actually looked at the cultural context of the countries which they've been operating in. And the fail was so miserable, so they made this big research. I'm sure you know this, uh, Hofstad, mm -hmm. the, the Dutch guy. So when he made this uh, five, initially it was four, now it's five yeah. dimensions, but which he clusterized every nation. So, and to give you a little bit of context about what Belarus is, mm -hmm. just like uh, I just wrote you uh, these numbers. It's very precise, very concrete research. It's not uh, too much lyrics here. So the first one is power distance. Yep. So, which means like um, uh, how far is a small guy in the organization from the big guy. Right. So, you know, like in this part of the world, you know, like if you're a big guy, you drive in a nice, amazing big car with mm -hmm. a lot of security, and it's, you don't drive in the bicycle to your office. So in some low distance power cultures, you have a much more connection between the high side of the society and the low one. So, and we have very large power distance yes. compared to the US. Yes. So we are 93 compared to 40. Yeah, it's one of the largest in the world. Yeah. Yes. So, and actually, second one where we are different from US mm -hmm. is individualism. Mm -hmm. So, and actually, in individualism, like we are 41 compared to 93. So, meaning like your country is super individualistic and uh, we are much more. Right. connected much more social and we think about us more as a group than basically individually. So, and actually there are masculinity, we have 36 compared to 62, means like we're not that aggressive. Russia is much different from us from this. Right. <laughs> and actually um, uncertainty avoidance, meaning like how likely we like uncertainty and we don't like it. <laughs> yeah. So US is 46 and, you are n uh, and we are 96. Yeah. So, and the last one is indulgence. So 69 compared to 20. Yeah. We have better indulgence. So actually, uh, so this is, and actually we are a very hard working country. We have uh, very well organized. We have um, uh, great people uh, who are very modest and uh, yeah. who are not too aggressive. You know, like our country is one of the best uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, like there's the lowest percentage of unpaid debt on time. So if somebody takes a debt from the bank, they pay it on time always. Right. Or like, you know, like there's a high, the lowest percentage of people who don't pay taxes on time. So it's like, so just to give you a sense about mm -hmm. which country we are in. So, and I'd like to have a discussion about how this, which you spoke about, is relevant for us. Sounds in this great. context. And my first question for you is basically, uh, like a lot of organizations here are sort of on the level three, yeah. I would say. And the problem is like they don't even understand level four or five exists. Yeah. And I had a discussion here just with uh, Igor Rybakov, who is going to have the, uh, who's going to be next on the stage. Mm -hmm. So, and he said that basically he haven't found level four and level five in his business. Mm -hmm. And which is why he moved to charity. And he's doing, he have basically haven't found it and created in his company and he basically found it elsewhere. So what would be, 
sort of your advice on how would you approach it? I mean, in terms of like, how would you help our managers to start thinking in the framework to move from level three to level four and level five effectively? Yeah, and um, so first of all, I'm very familiar with Hofstede. My uh, doctorate is in organizational communication and it was one of the very first things that I read and it was actually something that I look back on every time I go to a country that I haven't been. So I appreciate the grounding. And it's very useful for any of you who want to do business in other countries, even countries close by, to look up Hofstede and look across those factors. It, so if you look at the rise of business in any country, I'm thinking of South Africa now or a few years ago, it was similar. That companies were really, the, sort of the best companies, the best leaders were at stage three. And in my country, it was really right after World War II, the knowledge boom, people went to school and, and there was no thought that there could be anything like stage four. My mentor is a man named Warren Bennis, who's the founder of leadership. He passed away a few years ago, he was almost 90 years old. And Warren spent his life going around the world, telling people that stage four was even possible. Forget that you've seen it. He sold it as an idea and it caught on. And it caught on for two very important reasons. One, that it proved to be much more effective. And number two, it proved to be more fun. And so direct answer to your question, again, you and I have spent a little bit of time on this. Four and five, but let's talk about four, is all about a good story. It's all about a good lesson. It's all about something that you advertise. It's something that you tell the world is why your company exists beyond just we make this for this amount of money and you should buy it because it's cheaper. Let me tell you an example of what I mean. I was walking through the streets of Kuala Lumpur a number of years ago. And I was there with two professors, one from China, one from, I think from Pakistan. And as you know, professors are hopeless. You have a doctorate, so you're less hopeless than I am. But we were three professors and we were lost in Kuala Lumpur. And you may know this, but you shouldn't drink the water in Kuala Lumpur. So we were hot and we were thirsty and we were, didn't, couldn't find our way. And we walked and the streets all curved and it was before GPS and we couldn't find our way. And then we saw something that was the best thing that we had ever seen in our entire lives. And it was the McDonald's logo. <laughs> because that meant one thing. Water that we could drink and food that we could eat without getting sick. So what is a brand? You know, what's a brand? You think about a company brand. Brands are all over the place. My definition of a brand is very simple. It's a reason to charge more money and get away with it. That's a brand. And that's very powerful because you make more money. And at the heart of every brand is a story. And the story of McDonald's is a very simple one, as you know. It's all about consistency. No, no matter which McDonald's you walk into, you get the same thing. Some regional differences, but you get standardizations of food and same sorts of things. So people know what they're getting. And so that, I think, is a key. But if I could ask you a question back. Have you seen stage four or five in Belarus? And if so, what caused it to emerge? Okay, so... You know, I've had this, um, so first of all, I see stage five mostly in uh, charities and mostly in social businesses. And, uh, you know, pro-business is stage five. So this is doing a great job basically by connecting people. Let's have an applause for them. Doing, the team is amazing. So the stage four, I would say, uh, I mean, the stage four I've seen here are very often sort of motivated by success. Mm -hmm. So I had this talk of uh, Yuri Melinchik, who is like a very famous entrepreneur here, and he said like, I was trying to find this glue, which you're talking mm. about, for the organization to succeed for a startup. And I was trying loads of things and none of them worked. And it's very common because, you know, like, I mean, one of the things which I've learned through sort of learning a lot about management and a lot of things around it. I mean, all this science is very kind of impractical. It's not like math, not like physics. It's, you know, it's, it's like it's very context-based and it's yeah. not always applicable to transfer between contexts. 
So, and what he said, like the thing he found was success. Once our numbers started to grow, everybody was feeling like we are amazing. Yeah. So the interesting thing is like for us, it's, I mean, and I've seen it many times here as well. So like, you know, like a company starts to become successful, suddenly everybody else starts to think like we are great. But yeah. I have rarely seen like people to think this way before they go to some success, you know? Like, and the question is basically for me probably is like, how do you craft a story to make people believe they're going to success before they actually do. And that's probably very much relevant for us here. So what would be your advice? How would you approach this? How would you help us even to think about this in this storytelling framework? Yeah, so a story is always looking in the future. It's not looking back. You may look back for values or lessons, reasons why you were founded, but a, a story is always future looking. In the future, we will. and. I'll, I'll tell you a story actually about stage five that I found in the most unlikely place that I can imagine. Uh, it was in South Africa. It was a company that operated mines in two cities, Limpopo and uh, Americana. And my, uh, my wedding ring is platinum. So it requires tons of rock to be blown up from these underground mines and then brought up to the surface and then smelted down, refined to make something as big as this. So it's dirty, hot, awful work. It smells bad, you go down there, it smells like explosives and it's hot and it's humid from all the explosions and the water that gets mixed in. So it's just a miserable place to be. And I thought, there's no way this place could be anything other than stage one or stage two, right? I mean, it, at best, my life sucks because I'm in a mine. And the story actually gets worse because the rate of HIV the virus that causes AIDS, was 30% in the community. Most people were illiterate. They had crossed the border illegally uh, from the north, and so they were living illegally in the country. They lived in these, in these same-sex hostels, so men living together, it was actually all men. And so they were doing drugs with sharing needles, and that's why the HIV rate was so high. So I'm looking at the number one cause of death was not accidents in the mine, it was homicide. The HIV rate was 30% the illiteracy rate was almost 100%. And yet I saw people exhibiting stages four and five. It's like, how did that happen? And it all started with a group of people and in the mine, some white, some black, and they got together and they said, how mining is done is inhuman and it must stop and we are going to stop it. This was right at the point when Nelson Mandela's vision was at its height. This is about 2006, seven. And people said, notice the future focus. We are gonna make Mandela's view of Africa start in South Africa and specifically in this company. And it was one of the most amazing things I ever saw. They negotiated union management agreements very easily. These were among the highest paid mining workers anywhere in Africa. They did it with gain sharing. They didn't just say, I want to be paid more per hour. They said, no, we, we want to be paid for the work that we do, but we want to be paid fairly. They negotiated all that. It became a technological leader with silent mining and some of the best safety protocols and one of the most profitable mines anywhere in the world, like stage four, stage five in a mine. And so the essence, just going back to your question, is a story is all about looking forward. When they set that story, there was no evidence that that could ever be true. The evidence was the HIV rate, the death rate in accidents and so on. But they said it and then they found little ways to make it happen, not big ways, but little ways, little wins, you're familiar with that. Um, I have to tell you, I am rarely on stage with someone who has more college degrees than I do. You have more college <laughs> degrees than I do. So if I could ask you a question, we're talking a lot about Belarus and what specifically happens here. I'm curious what you've seen works in creating stage four, not just in Belarus, but you've lived in so many places and you've studied so many places and you've created businesses in so many places. Is there a universal to get people to stage four? So you know what, I, actually your example is amazing and it's very much resonates to the things which we see here. So, you know, like uh, we have this, like, again, going back to 
you know, like there are a lot of very boring businesses, mm -hmm. you know, like, and they still need to be done. You know, somebody need, for example, to clean the floors, for example, you know, and the, you know, like the, my best and favorite story about it is like when John Kennedy came to the place where they launched shuttles from mm -hmm. and asked the cleaner, like, what you're doing here? And uh, the cleaner told him, you know what, Mr. President, I'm helping to launch the man to the moon. And you know, when a man uses, uh, cleans the floor with such an attitude, I mean, you don't need to manage him at all. <laughs> right. Uh, he just does it, you know? Yeah. And the interesting uh, uh, point about it, and actually, uh, uh, so and in boring businesses, you can actually find a mission on the higher level, on the level of the industry. So your example is a good example of it. So basically people were thinking about uh, how do they sort of not, not what they do in their particular business, mm -hmm. but what they do as an industry as a whole. And it's an interesting way to think about it, an interesting way to create a story. Because one of the uh, cases which is again relevant to Belarus is we have this sort of very much connected and united IT industry, mm -hmm. and which has a wider story about basically the way we see the future of the world. Yes. And you believe there's going to be a lot of automation and a lot of the uh, regular jobs will disappear and we need to change our country in order to stay relevant in 20 years. We need to change education, we need to change, uh, we need to make the IT industry flourish and basically we've done a lot of good things around it. Yeah. So basically, uh, an interesting point is like, if you look at it this way, so we have found a sense of purpose and the story on a higher level by thinking about us, not as a particular, not just only one company, but thinking about us as all companies. Right. I'm not saying that each of the companies doesn't have its own story, but effectively, if you think about the broader picture, so the IT industry sort of understands themselves as an IT industry and right. communicates a lot about it. So in terms of the things which I've seen working uh, in a different context, I mean, I can, tell, I can say basically there's a very really big difference between mm -hmm. sort of hiring people here and hiring people in the US. Sure. And in uh, some other countries. So like if you hire a manager, okay, so I hired, I hired a guy mm -hmm. in London and he came to our office and you know the first thing he asked us was like, guys, what is our mission? You don't hire a guy in Belarus, he doesn't ask you this question, just never. Right. <laughs> you know, like, and actually, uh, it's very, very rare. Not only he asks you this, but he kind of starts a lot of discussion and spends loads of time on sort of understanding basically what is our mission with all the management, with all the people. And, you know, a lot of guys in this room probably and in some other places will think, I mean, he's just wasting his time. He just yeah. go and do the stuff done, right? But the point is basically that uh, sort of, uh, Thinking, understanding that it's important is much less, actually there's much less understanding here about the importance of uh, mm -hmm. the storytelling and about sort of spending time together as a group and trying to search for different ideas. And probably I think it's, yeah. I mean, if you are to create some takeaways from the discussion, so probably thinking about your industry mm -hmm. and what problem it solves for the society is probably one of the great ways to sort of move from level three to level four. Mm, that's good. Yeah, so what do you think uh, would be other ones? Like what do you think, wh what else can people do to sort of build up great stories? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think of a, of a company that I um, studied, never consulted there in um, Japan, um, which is very different from my country in Hofstad scale. And it's the largest private owned, sorry, largest family owned business in Japan. It started right after World War II. Man was selling peaches on the streets of Tokyo. So he was selling peaches and his wife would go buy the peaches and fill up his basket and then he would sell the peaches and his, that was the business. And you jump forward now and they're in the, in the housing business. So they buy, buy houses, sell houses, make houses, make construction products for houses and it's kind of all of that. And they were searching about 20 years ago for a story that would link them together. And they were searching, they were searching, they were searching. And finally someone said the Japanese word for Polaris, kind of the North Star. 
And they said, we want to be, because people go home to their, their houses, right, their homes, and that's their center. And they said, we want to create the North Stars for all the families in Japan. And I don't want to exaggerate what happened next because the business didn't explode because it suddenly had a good story, but it provided focus and it provided a sense of direction for people. Uh, so I think spending time really looking for the meaning of a company, I know that may be a strange word and it may not be used a lot here. Again, my mentor Warren Bennis said, leadership is the management of meaning. What does it mean to work in a company? Mm. And when it means something more than just a paycheck, then people will go to remarkable lengths. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So actually, you know, like I like this, you know, my Stanford professor always told me like leadership is all about defining a game you play mm. and making people win. Oh, that's good. So basically like it's interesting because and actually it's relevant to the idea that the companies kind of get from level three to level four yeah. when they win basically. And it's interesting, like you can actually, uh, winning is defined by management. You know, right. we, have, we, have, we have an interesting case here. For example, like we have a company I mean, in IT industry, we have a company, IPAM. Mm -hmm. And the games they play, like we are the best who hires the most people. Yeah. And we are the number one in the number of people we hired. And basically, and this is why we, we win. You know, like a different company plays a game like uh, we have uh, we are making some product which is used by 100 million people. And we are number yeah. one in this, and basically, which is why everybody else sucks. Yeah. So, you know, an interesting approach could be to start about thinking how do you create stories uh, by structuring the game and winning it. Oh, that's really good. So, well, and it's interesting is you've got a huge social media following. And I remember when I first uh, heard from a gentleman named, uh, you may know him, Tony Shays, the CEO of Zappos, this online shoe company. They're now part of Amazon. And he had 5 million Twitter followers as many years ago. And it was just, un first of all, it was unimaginable to me. Why would someone want 5 million Twitter followers? I couldn't even imagine. Like, what's the point? What's the purpose of that? So you can tell people you're having breakfast and you tweet that. I couldn't even imagine it. But n notice, and I think you were earlier to the game than I, and I'm, I don't have a big social media following, but there are people who turn that into a game, right? Let's see how yeah. many followers we can get on, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter. And, and as people played that game, they then found a way, once they'd won that game, to use the victory in that game to win another game. Correct. And win another game. That's fun. Correct. So basically, like, we see this a lot. And basically what I think would be a great takeaway for sort of our local situation is you can create a game yourself. Mm. You don't necessarily need to play somebody else's game. Just find your game and win it. And find an easy one, <laughs> for, especially for your organization. Like, it could yeah. be like we are making the most doors in Belarus, for example, you know, like, yeah. or whatever it is. So basically, uh, effectively, uh, so on top of sort of thinking about the higher level of the industry, it could be like basically creating yeah. a game which people play. So, you know, my other thought around this is actually, if you think about it from the personal level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, like I've read this book called, uh, by Robert McKee mm -hmm. called The Story. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing guy. It's like probably the best book I've read about storytelling. So, uh, Robert McKee is the father of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, he was actually behind many script writers who basically scripted the best movies we all know in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, his book is amazing. Like the guy really understands what is the story. And one of the most interesting things there which I found is basically he said that, um, you know, uh, the reason why we have such a hunger for stories is because we don't really know how to live. Mm. And what means basically living. And actually, uh, and that's why we are looking at all these movies and trying to understand what this world is all about, basically. And the, and the true essence of them is to create this meaning, to tell a story about some sort of deep archetypes inside yeah. the humans uh, and connect to them. So uh, he was actually, uh, and he was making this comparison about uh, stereotypical stories and archetypical stories. I don't know how it's going to be translated to Russian, but <laughs> so basically, uh, 
so the archetypical stories are the ones which are sort of st uh, very relevant to everybody, to every human being. Mm -hmm. And stereotypical stories are something very super local. So archetypical stories, in his view, they travel in time, move around the world, yeah. and are the reason why like 80% of the screen time belongs to Hollywood, while they're just a very small percentage of all the production in the world. So, and uh, uh, what he is uh, saying about is basically like you need to connect to create a meaningful story which can travel in time and in, the in, in, uh, in between continents you need to connect to something very deep inside the human soul. Mm. Like a problem of, you know, like friendship, love, you know, life or death and other kind of things. So, and that can be also an interesting approach. How do you build a story by sort of thinking about the deep internal problems in a human and what you're actually trying to solve. So yeah. I've had this, you know, like I've, I've seen this, I've been to a Facebook conference and actually uh, they had this guy from Uber. Mm -hmm. And he started his speech by showing us a video ad about Uber. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing ad. You look at it and think like Uber is a space shuttle company. Uber is just a taxi driving car <laughs> company. I mean, yeah. in essence, right? It's just like you can just call a driver, he just brings you one from one place from to another. Right. But if you look at this movie, it's just amazing. Like basically, they show like you, like we are bringing people, we are telling them to help, we are, we are great, they're going to create drones, we are going to fly them to the moon. And like, yeah. it's amazing, beautiful video. Amazing ca case of storytelling. So, uh, and they connect to an ultimate desire of people to travel and basically right. to switch time. So I think basically kind of thinking about it from the perspective of deep human problems mm -hmm. could be another way sort of to move from level three to level four. That's really good. Um, let me drop one thing in and then I have a question for you. Uh, I used to be involved in a class at my university. Stanford's a better university than mine. I'm at the University of Southern California. But we're very well known for having a cinema school. We have the top cinema school in the world. And so we'd have this class, the, the college president, at the time his name was Steve Sample, would teach it, Warren Bennis, and then I came in to help. It's the three of us teaching it. And every week we'd have a different guest speaker. So one of the guest speakers we had come in was Robert Zemeckis, the filmmaker. We also had um, George Lucas come in. We had the head of NASA come in. We had really interesting people come in, Fortune 500 CEOs, all sorts of interesting people. But everybody's favorite was Robert Zemeckis. And they would ask him, almost every class, of all the movies you've made, as you made Back to the Future and Forrest Gump, made a number of movies, of all the movies you've made, which was your favorite? And he'd think about it for a minute. It was like he'd never heard the question before. And he'd think about it and he'd say, it was Forrest Gump. That was my favorite movie. Obvious question is why? And he said, because we were all making the same movie the script writer and the people moving the lights and the photographers and the actors, they were all making the same movie. They all had the same vision. And he contrasted that to other movies that I won't name because I don't think he'd want to repeat it outside the room. Where one, back to your point, one person was making a movie about death and one person was making a movie about love and another person was making a movie about battle mm -hmm. and it was the same movie. Yeah. And so it wasn't watchable because it didn't tell a coherent story. My question for you is we've been ta talking a lot about getting from three to four, and there are a lot of people really stuck at two. And I'm curious what you've seen has been helpful to get people from two to three. So actually, that's a good question. <laughs> because you see a lot of organizations, uh, I mean, here probably there is no people at level two, <laughs> but there are a lot of uh, people who you hire and they are sort of on level two. So, you know, like I think that um, first of all, like there are two ways to think about it. So the first way is basically to think about to that each person has probably has his own limits in how much he can believe in something, hmm. no matter of what kind of the story is going to be. So, and I mean, probably there are people who Kind of, you know, there are people who are easily excitable and can really, really deeply believe in something. And there are somebody who is probably much less of that. So I would say basically this question kind of divides into two. And basically which one, first one is like, what do you do with guys who are easily excitable, but they're kind of in the down of their life? Mm. Or 
is basically people who have never ever been excited and don't even have this feeling. And on the right. sort of neuroscience and kind of behavioral economics level standpoint, they haven't even experienced the feeling of society and the feeling of kind of uh, uh, believing in something too much. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I have never ever kind of helped anybody probably to get from two to three maybe, <laughs> unfortunately, but I don't, I, uh, Unless they kind of temporarily there, but I mean, but yeah. I don't know. Like, what do, what do you think? What what would you think would be the best strategy to? Well, it's it's tricky because there's a trap in two which people don't see. Actually, the two traps. One is if you if you're surrounded by other people who are at two, it's a very comfortable place to be, right? You're not on the hook for anything. You're not being held accountable, and. If you try hard and fail, you've got a group of people that tells you that's okay. That's just the way the world is set up. The world isn't fair, so it's okay to fail. And so it's a very easy place to be. That's the first hook. And the second hook is it can be really funny. And I mean funny like telling jokes. If, if you go to comedy clubs, and I've been at comedy clubs around the world, I won't tell jokes because they never translate. But when comedians tell jokes, it's almost always at stage two. And they're talking about how their wife or their girlfriend or their boyfriend mm. is this way and their car is broken and their boss is mean. And it's never, my life's great. That's never, that's never funny. It's, oh, you don't understand how awful things is. This happened and this happened and everyone's laughing and then the story goes on and everyone's kind of laughing. So it can also be a very funny place. And what, what I found in, in companies is there are these natural comedians. So a chief executive will give a speech and then five minutes later, the comedian will be, telling a version of it that's very right disparaging and he's got sort of an audience but to to your question if you can find that person that natural comedian who's kind of at the heart of stage two and flip him or her mm. to stage three it's like the pied piper all the others come with mm, interesting. So you can find the one person and so then the trick is how do you how do you do that right how do you find the one person and in my experience Usually that person is very cynical because they've been deeply hurt about something. There's something they wanted for their life and it didn't happen. And so they gave up. And then they found that they could be funny. So if you, if you ask them questions that get to sort of that hurt, what is it you wanted to happen? Or ask it future forward, what is it you'd like to happen? And they'll tell you why it can't happen, but eventually they might get around to it. And if you can reimagine, reawaken the dream in them, they'll move to three. Hmm. It's a very powerful thing to see. Y you know, actually, uh, that's interesting. You know, uh, I can tell you a story. So a guy, a Russian guy, IT guy, wrote an article in English about his biohacking. And it's very popular right now among managers. People kind of think that they have not enough they need to do something with their body to be successful. Right. And he's like drinking like loads of different medicines. He has like 10 doctors. Like, and this guy is like probably the top biohacker in the world. Like, and um, so he wrote an article and published it at Silicon Valley. And every single guy wrote, read it. And so they're saying like, this is an amazing article. And the comments were like, oh, Sergey, you're amazing. This is very mm. interesting. You know, basically, oh, like how do you wear these blue glasses before sleep? And how do you like do this kind of, he's like, he's really on top of all, everything he does. So, and he translated it to Russian. Mm -hmm. It was his big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so he published it on VC.ru yeah. and became the most viewed article on VC.ru in the year it was published. Probably in 2017 it was published. So, and like, he and he got like ten thousand comments there, mm -hmm. and like people were saying like, "Oh, you're crazy! What, <laughs> how, what you can do?" You know. And actually, if you read forums in Russian, and basically for me, it feels like people who write comments, basically they are probably level either one or two. Right. And they're doing some psychotherapy, you know, basically yeah. by kind of, you know, like, "Oh, this guy's an idiot. I hate him," you know, basically. Right. And by the way, you know, like our government people really think this is a this is the way nation thinks. I mean. I mean, some of them basically really read these forums and think, oh, this yeah. is the way our nation thinks about something. But it's only crazy people who write. I mean, people on level four, have you ever wrote a comment? I mean, on the, on the social media? I mean, probably very rarely, right? But and there are some guys Rarely, yeah. So who are basically kind of continuously write these comments. And this is, you know, like a sort of like a way to write a diary. 
know, some people write a diary, and it helps a lot to remove the stress. And these guys write comments. Oh, he's an idiot. He, I hate him. You know, like, you know he, like, his wife is something there. Oh, like, I've had he's doing this. You know, you can never, ever read a nice comment about yourself. And uh, I mean, I can show you comments about discussion. So you probably say you're. <laughs> <laughs> and, actually, uh, uh, and actually, what is interesting is like, uh, if you take all of them and probably try to convert them <laughs> this way, yeah. this will not work. Another point which I uh, kind of wish resonates is actually I've read this book about a guy who was the book called Trying to Survive. Mm. And the guy basically spent all his life exploring extreme situations people got to. Mm. Like a car wreck, like a shipwreck, the guy's on the boat in the middle of nowhere and he stays there, or like some kind of things like that. And he said, and he was exploring people who survived and people who did not. Mm. And there were a number of different advices he gave, like what you do if you are in the middle of the desert or whatever it is. But the biggest one was the most sort of easy one to use was to use humor. Mm. Because interestingly, like when you use humor, you activate your rational thinking. Yeah. And if you don't, you sort of kind of stay in negative emotions and negative irrational kind of mood and you want to say, oh, I hate him, you know, basically, oh, like, Oh, I have like these 10 bottles of water, I will drink them now. You know, like, it doesn't right. matter, like, I'm in the middle of, of the ocean. So, and basically using humor is probably an interesting way to sort of approach it. And actually... Uh, that's real, that, that, actually, that's good. I, and I have a story that follows up on that. There was a, uh, you've done some mergers and acquisitions work. So I, in healthcare, I was working with a company that was bought by a much larger company. And this was one department of the company. And they realized they were going to get replaced by the bigger department. They were going to lose their jobs. And... One day, one person came in and started kind of making fun of the group and the other, a and they all started laughing. And the great effect that it had, which I think is what you're pointing to, is that it leveled the playing field. Mm. No longer were they the big parent company that's coming in to replace our jobs. They're people who look funny in their pants and slobber when they speak. And it was kind of all of these very sort of divisive, or not divisive, but... Uh, uh, deriding comments and, and as everyone kind of started to laugh they realized we have a chance here we have a fighting chance and when the merger happened the small group got most of the jobs mm. is it, it it taught them that they could they could fight that they could win mm -hmm. that's actually really good so using humor is great you should write a book about that <laughs> you should you can do it uh, you can so you know what what uh, my other direction would be uh, where we should probably uh, can be thought of is actually how do you it's not only about the story it's also about the way you tell it mm. and you know like uh, basically you can have an amazing story but uh, if you're not really great in telling it it will, just, it will fail mm -hmm. and I can tell you a, a story so I had this uh, when I was uh, uh, when I was young I had I was very very young I had like a software engineer who worked mm. for us and the software engineer like, was really, really bad, like completely yeah. a disaster. Like all he did basically, he was copying code, he was Googling some stuff, he was copying, cutting, pasting code and making like this big, amazing system which never worked. Yeah. And uh, I haven't been able to fire him for like a year. And you know why? He was coming to me and, and, and I realized, then when I when actually Googled him and found his LinkedIn, I, I understood why. So the guy haven't finished computer science degree. Mm -hmm. But you know what was his degree? He was uh, a professional, he finished a theater school. Mm. He had this amazing voice, he was saying like, hello, Victor, this system will work, promise you. <laughs> it's going to happen now. The only reason it doesn't work is because it's like, you know, it's not a time. <laughs> yeah. It will. <laughs> and this was going on for a year. You know, like, and actually, I think uh, what is in a, a good uh, sort of my learning from that was that you know, basically, sometimes the way you tell the story mm. is probably as important as the story itself. Mm. And with a modern, and you know, actually, if you think about the best, like, kind of, the most professional level of five organizations, mm -hmm. probably they are around religion, right? Yeah. These guys are amazing at this. And so what they do, I mean, when they go to people, they don't email them. They don't call them, you know, mm -hmm. but they go and speak with them verbally. And they're using a really professional voice, you know, mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. 
And basically, you know, like people very often forget that management is not about sending emails and calling and, you know, like, and, like running all around the office. Right. A lot of it is just talking to people, right? And the way you talk is actually what I found out is basically that not many people are, it's very, very rare somebody has a beautiful voice from the verse. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, like if you hear a beautiful voice, like the guy who translates us has a beautiful voice probably. <laughs> and actually <laughs> much better than we are. So basically, and True. I mean, he was working very hard on uh, getting there, right? So actually you need to work hard to build up the voice in order to tell the story. So, and sometimes it is so important that basically if you can do it really nicely, you can probably get a better paycheck, you can probably make your team perform more nicely and, you know, and so on and so forth. So what do you think about other ways to sort of tell the story in a much about the tools to, about the instruments which people can use to tell the story nicer and make mm -hmm. it resonate? Uh, there's a friend of mine, he's a psychiatrist, uh, his name is Mark Goulston, and he, that's his life's work, it's how do you tell great stories. And he uses the phrase experience rich. So if you tell an experience rich story, it, the person finds themselves in that situation. They, they actually live the events in their minds, they picture it. And if you look even in a, a fMRI, the same parts of the brain are firing than if you actually experienced it, mm. which is the power of stories, right? Be, because if you tell me a story, I don't have to go through what you went through. I can learn the lesson just by hearing the story. But so what does experience rich mean? Now, two, two versions of, of the same scene. One is I walked in a coffee shop, ordered some coffee. It was really hot and I put it down and left. And the other version, same story is I walked in a coffee shop and I was so thirsty and I was tired and I was jet lagged. So actually me this morning. And I got this coffee, which I really wanted. And I knew that it was too hot. I knew it was too hot. And I thought to myself, it's just going to burn me and it's going to burn my tongue. And I'm going to sound drunk when I'm on stage because I'm going to have a burned tongue, but I drank it anyway and it burned my tongue. And I was so mad at myself that I dropped it and I walked out. Same story, but one had no point, one had no lesson. The other was experience rich. We all know the feeling of wanting coffee mm -hmm. and holding it in your hand and you know it's gonna burn you and then the feeling of that it burns your tongue. So it, when you tell the experience rich part, again, my friend is a psychiatrist so he studies firing of the brain. He, he said it's remarkable and I'll just tell you one more quick thing about him, about why that research is so important. He went on to start suicide prevention networks all around the world. And what he learned was that the single thing that was most useful in preventing suicides was to hear stories of people who had attempted suicide and failed. Mm. And one of the ones that he would tell is that someone jumped off a bridge and as soon as they jumped off the bridge, they knew they had made a terrible mistake. They had made the biggest mistake of their life. And how were they ever going to fix this? There was no way to fix it. They were doomed and they were falling. The water was getting closer and they were scared and they were terrified. They thought of all the people that they were going to let down. And then they were unconscious. And because we usually are unconscious, we hit the water. But then they survived, usually with broken bones. And when they tell the story, you've just given someone the opportunity to try to commit suicide and fail mm. and experience all of the regret that people experience, but usually the act that they've taken has consequences that we understand. And so Mark Wilston said, if you just begin telling those stories and people picture that moment of regret, that actually keeps them from taking the act. So telling stories is so powerful. Yeah. yeah. So I know we have about 15 minutes left here. I'm curious, mm -hmm. you're very good at summarizing, bringing together. For you, what are the most important takeaways of our conversation so far? Okay, so I just like to finish, uh, you know, like I had this talk about, the, I will tell one story and I'll go, yeah. I can do it. So basically I had this talk about a guy who finished Yale school mm -hmm. and he went to the uh, alumni, meet, uh, alumni meeting uh, where all his classmates been there and he spoke with them and uh, they had a very open conversation about like, are you happy or not? Mm. And he realized like 80% of them are not happy. Mm. at all. And uh, 
they've been working very hard. They had amazing education. They were like, you know, like, like having their first wife and second wife and third wife and first house and, and you know, and so on and so forth. So like, and they all were very, very much unhappy. And then he spoke with uh, the last 20% and tried to realize why they've been happy. And he came out with this framework. Uh, of five questions, how do you find your life purpose? Oh, that's great. And how do you find your sort of uh, life story, which you can build your organizational story probably on top. And uh, the framework is very easy, so I can do it with you now. Please. <laughs> the first one, he was asking um, a question like, who you are? <laughs> very simple one. Like, I mean, you are David, right? So probably. Second question is like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Um, I uh, write, consult, and I'm a healthcare executive. Okay, for who? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I have to tell a very quick story. I had a catastrophic car accident in 2012. I shattered my jaw. Didn't think I'd be able to return to teaching. And I realized I had been teaching for me. And from that moment, I started teaching for students. For students. Mm, okay. And how has it changed as a result? Well, it's funny, before my car accident, actually the day before, I wrote a letter of resignation to the president of the university. I just hadn't sent it. It was sitting in my drafts folder. I just forgot to send it. And then ended up in the hospital, was there for quite a while. When I finally got discharged, I deleted it. And so it, teaching went from being an obligation, something that I did, um, frankly, because I was too lazy to do anything else, just I knew how to do it, to something that I chose, and the amount of passion and commitment went up. Oh, these are great questions. Yeah, yeah. So, and actually, so that's actually how these guys think you should create your own story first in your sort of sense of life mm. in order to build your organizational life. So you find out who you are, which is very simple, what you do, yeah. who you do it for, and how these people change as a result. Mm. And if you look at this, three questions out of this are not like probably like two questions out of those are not about you they are about other people right and the interesting point is like uh, his idea was that you become happy only when you find a sense of purpose to help other people effectively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was the difference between this 20 percent and 80 percent and it's very much you know like irrational because a lot of business people think that basically like, oh i'm making money i should be the best and it's for me so then they have a lot of money and then he just buys and he's realized he can't eat more than three times a day. He right. realized he don't need these five cars. He realizes, I mean, like, and uh, basically, and uh, some of the business people, some of the very wise business people I've met, say basically, you know, sort of made this money and then realized probably a better way would be if they had a sense of purpose from the beginning. Mm. And actually, you know, like there are two best days in somebody's life. Like one is the day you burn, and second one, the day you find your purpose oh, and you find good. a meaning, basically. And actually, once they passed all this way, sort of came to charity or some other ideas, they realized, I mean, they probably could have written, uh, lived a much happier and much better life if they yeah. were thinking not only about themselves, but about the overall situation. So, and if uh, mm. I think I would summarize this, I would say basically, so first of all, like, you know, build Russian managers need to understand that the story is super important. Yeah. And you can actually work much less if you have a great story. Because effectively, you don't need to, I mean, the cleaner guy in this space shuttle place probably didn't need too much management because he was believing in the story too much. Right. So, and actually understanding the story is important and understanding the story storytelling can actually help you to be much happier and pretty much work less because mm -hmm. if people share your story, people understand it, people believe it, you probably don't need to work that much. I think this is a great sort of first idea. Second one is actually how do you do it? It's probably all around sort of, you can think about wider industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a great takeaway for me to build a story. You can think about uh, your own sense of purpose and sort of trying to build it and trying to find a match, is there is really a match between what you do mm -hmm. and actually what your organization is doing. Yeah. 
actually finding uh, some uh, actually uh, what else? What else was thinking about? Like about moving from of building a story. So connecting to some deep human needs and actually using and understanding not only about how do you build the story, but also the modern tools to build them. So like yeah. voice, you know, video and loads of other things. So that would be my sort of way to look at it. Well, that's, that's a great list. Um, I actually don't have anything to add. It does spark a different one, kind of going back to stage two. Um, I told the story about the mine and stage four, stage five in the South African mine. One of the things that we discovered in, in doing that book, uh, worked with some of the top academics around the world, this comes from behavioral economics, which you've studied, is that in every culture, there is a story, a narrative, that people think they're telling. The crazy thing is, they hardly ever talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so if the narrative we think we're telling is that we're losing as a company, we'll never be great. We never discuss it, but behavioral economics says people will then behave as if it's true. Hmm. So one of the most powerful tools in leadership and management is getting people to tell the story that they think the company or the department is already telling. Oh, that's very cool. You know what I think is yeah. actually, I think the best way for a person to realize he needs to create his own story yeah. is because you cannot have no story, right. effectively. There is a story. Right. It will be easy created for you, by you. It can be a story like, oh, we are working for this greedy bastard who is basically going to, like, who is making money from us, you know, basically, and this everything we do here, you know, basically. And they yeah. will still build a story yeah. because humans are organized in stories. So you'd better think about your story yourself then people will sort of tell it for you. I mean, this is probably a great sort of motivation for thinking about the importance of storytelling. That's really, that's good. There's never an absence of story. That's actually going to be my big takeaway. And just to link it for everybody, one way to look at the five levels is there are five types of stories. Level one is I'm in hell. <laughs> and I can't get out. So there is a story. There's a story. I'm in yes. hell. I can't get out. And, and level two is not I'm in hell. Um, it's also a story. So you see, there is no situation with no story, right? So there's, yeah, there's always a, a story, right? Yeah. And the, st and the story is it just sucks to be me right now. Yes. That's a story, right? That's a story. And, and the third one is, uh, it's, the, it's the superhero story. Um, I actually got to go behind the scenes and, and see a superhero uh, movie filmed a couple days ago with, with one of my daughters at green screen and all that kind of amazing stuff. But, you know, all those stories is, you know, like I'm, I'm Batman. Mm -hmm. and no one else is. And, you know, the problem is if you tell that story, it shrinks the room for other people to tell their stories, right? There's not enough room left. And then stage four, it's a we story. Mm -hmm. And then the story at stage five, that's your Cape Canaveral. Well, what are you doing Was you're mopping the floor? Exploring space. Yeah. It's a story. It is. It's amazing. Yeah. We got a long way. And I also noticed this has not been combative. Yeah. I mean, we had this dancing battle, so. <laughs> Very I'm fast sorry one. for interrupting <laughs> your discussion, so-called battle. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, time is running out. Uh, I'm here, Victor uh, and Dave, mm -hmm. I I'm here. Okay, uh, we just have a few minutes for maybe two questions, uh, live questions. We have microphones down here. You are very intellectual people. Uh, <laughs> thank you for your stories. Maybe everyone, uh, uh, someone of you have a question to our speakers? You are brilliant. <laughs> no, one. no, one question, please, one question. One question, let's applause to these people, please. Можно на русском языке будет перевод Дэйву, можно на английском, как вам удобно. Дэвид, uh, my name is Vladimir Plavsky, company Aquaecology. How do you evaluate yourself? At what stage are you are right now? Well, I thought I was going to be at stage two right now because we were going to have this battle. And <laughs> if you don't know anything about him, then you should look him up. And I did. And I realized I was probably going to be meat on the floor about now. <clears throat> so I'd expected to be two. Honestly, in this moment, I'm experiencing five. Uh, and the reason is the storytelling that I think you brought up is so powerful. That's a transformational idea. If, and there's a lot been written on it, but a lot of it is inaccessible. If we could make that better, if we could package it, if we could make it more usable, that's a really great idea. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank Happy you. you are.
Thank you. Thank you. And one more question, please. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Tamara. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> no. Oh, there you Just, are. Yes, hello. Uh, you had five questions from Victor, but the fifth one was uh, how you've changed, not about the people you were working with. So can mm. you please, you've, ch you've told that uh, you've uh, changed your attitude, your attitude, not there. Can you please answer the fifth question again? Do you understand? Yes. Um, okay. okay, let me let me answer a slightly different one, but I'll make it very quick. Okay. Uh, I mentioned I also work in healthcare, and healthcare in my country is just a mess. You know what it's like? It's just a mess. And my mother died of a medical injury, which is a fancy way of saying the healthcare system killed her. People didn't intend to kill her, but she was killed in a medical injury. And so I do work for patients and specifically for elderly patients. No one should pass away like my mother passed away. So how that changed me is obvious. How it changed others though is amazing. Patients become not recipients of care. They become human beings, vital human beings with lives and stories and their families become vital aspects to that. And then the caregivers, the doctors and nurses, they become heroes in that story. They're not just cogs in a machine, they're heroes. So, and I think you helped me discover this, a story doesn't just transform how you see yourself, it transforms how others see you and how others see other people. Everyone is transformed by a great story. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys, for your discussion, for your wisdom, and for your stories. Thank you. Victor Prokopena, Dave Logan. Thank you.